Zion. I'll be talking about oxygen levels in cancer. <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, yeah, I work at OCR with Paul Boutros and Rob Bristow. Um, so I'll start with some non-controversial statements. Uh, I think we can all agree that cancer is a big problem. Uh, around the world, there are around 14 million cases of cancer diagnosed every year, and 8 million people die of the disease yearly. Um, so it's complicated, and studying it from different angles can help us understand it, and then that should, in theory, eventually lead to improved outcomes for patients. Uh, so I'll talk about prostate cancer a little bit. This is what I mostly work on, uh, and one in seven Canadian men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer over their lifetime, so in this room, that's like two or three men. Uh, and right now, when someone comes in, into the clinic, what happens is we do basically three or four things and we try to stratify their risk and then we treat them based on that risk. So we'll do a prostate exam, we'll do some imaging to see how far the cancer has spread. Uh, we'll do a biopsy to actually look at the cancer cells under the microscope and see how bad they are and then do a blood test. And we consider all of this and then we assign patients a risk group. Usually uh, patients are classified into low, intermediate or high risk prostate cancer very rarely will you be diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, so you have these different risk groups, and not surprisingly, uh, you know, patients do uh, different, patients respond differently to treatment based on which group they're in. So if they're in the very favorable low risk group, they do quite well. So this is a Kaplan Meier plot. Uh, the y axis here shows relapse rates. So every time one of these lines drops down a little bit, it's someone having a relapse of their cancer. And on the, on the x axis, you have time. So as you move along, uh, as you go further in time, you see that more and more patients have relapse. But it's different in each group. So the lower risk patients do quite well, their line is quite horizontal, but then intermediate risk and high risk patients do much worse. And in this intermediate risk group specifically, around 30% of patients will have a relapse. So their cancer will come back. Uh, and if you notice, you know, throughout this process, I haven't talked yet about genomics or oxygen levels. And that's because we don't really consider it right now. So when someone comes to the clinic, what I'm describing is what happens, and then genomics don't really play a part yet, despite all we know about how mutations can play a role in how aggressive the cancer is. And to sort of um, you know, fix that issue, uh, there are international projects that are trying to characterize the genomics of thousands of cancers. So in Canada, uh, there are projects ongoing for prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and brain cancers. Uh, but around the world, people are working to sequence cancers, find their mutations, and then uh, see what that means for patients, and just also basic biology. But uh, it's not just the mutations in cancer that make it bad. Cancers that exist in a dynamic environment that, um, that can play a big role in how a patient responds to treatment. So in normal tissues, the vasculature is organized in a really nice hierarchy. And this ensures that all cells in the tissue get the nutrients they need. Um, including oxygen. But in tumors, the vasculature can be very disorganized. So it can be leaky. You can also have mixing of blood that's oxygenated and deoxygenated. And this leads to a half of all solid cancers um, being what we call hypoxic or having low levels of oxygen. Now in this room, if I lowered the level of oxygen, uh, you guys would not be very happy. Your behavior would change. Uh, cancers are similar to that. So when you lower the level of oxygen in a cancer, they behave differently and they become more aggressive. They're actually resistant to chemotherapy, surgery, uh, and um, radiation therapy, which are basically the main ways we treat cancer. So it's a big problem. Now, traditionally, uh, the way we measure oxygen levels in cancer, they're very logistically challenging and they require you know, experts to do it and they can be very labor intensive. And this has limited research on hypoxia to be basically limited to tens of patients at a time, which makes it difficult to do a lot of clinical work. So our solution to this was to use mRNA signatures. So in our body, we have DNA. From that, we make mRNA. And under ox low oxygen levels, the mRNA levels in our body actually change. And we can use those mRNA changes to figure out how hypoxic a cancer is. So we did that. Um, and because we're doing, we're doing this all computationally, we can actually do it simultaneously for thousands of cancers. So we applied mRNA signatures to uh, the data. And this is all public data. Um, and we get scores, and th those scores reflect how much oxygen these cancers have. So this slide represents uh, three and a half years worth of work, um, but basically we applied our signatures to public data, and then we get hypoxia scores for around 8,000 cancers. So again, this is an order of magnitude bigger than any previous study of, like this, just because we're doing this computationally and we're getting around a lot of the earlier limitations of hypoxia-related research. 
So I'll point out two main things. So the y-axis here uh, shows hypoxia score. So the higher the number, the more hypoxic, so the lower the oxygen levels in the cancer. And on the x-axis, we have tumor types, so 19 cancer types. Um, so the two main points to take away from this are that a lot of the tumor types that we know have issues with hypoxia, these are cancer types like head and neck cancer, cerebral cancer, uh, bladder cancer. These show up on the right side of our plot. And these are some of the, and that indicates that our scores indicate they're the more hypoxic cancer type. And these are all cancers where there have been clinical trials for hypoxia targeting agents. So this reinforces a little bit that the way we're measuring hypoxia is actually relevant to what people have shown before in the clinic. Uh, something else I'll point out is that if you just look at the top third of this plot, um, you know, like 15 of the cancer types have some patients in there. So within each, almost each cancer type, there's a subset of patients that are hypoxic. And if you look at something like breast cancer, for example, this is the largest single cancer type we have, so shown right here. Uh, there are 1,100 patients that we scored for breast cancer, and there are patients that span almost the entire spectrum on hypoxia scores. So there's some really, really hypoxic cancers up here. There's also some cancers that have basically normal levels of oxygen. So this tells us that if we're going to clinically target hypoxia, we can't just target it towards you know, an entire cancer type. We have to find patients who actually have an issue with this um, with the hypoxia and target them. Just like if you had you know, a targeted mutation, so for BRAF mutation, you don't give it to everyone, you give it to patients who have a BRAF mutation. So similarly with hypoxia, if we're gonna target this clinically, we have to target it to patients who actually have an issue. And then we did some more interesting stuff where we can then start to look at multiple things at once. So here we're showing that it actually matters the context of the mutation for a cancer. So here we're looking at P10, uh, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And we're showing that if you look at this dark blue group, they're really the, the patients that have the largest relapse rates. And these are patients that have a specific mutation, but they also have hypoxia, so they also have low oxygen. So just having a mutation might be bad sometimes, but if you look at patients who have a mutation in a specific environment, then that can help you find subgroups that are actually really aggressive. And then we can begin to layer more information on top of this. So this is the same plot as before, but now we're also adding pathology information and adding information about how tumors evolve over time, which is also important. And now we can begin to find this subgroup, the red subgroup, where the relapse rates are really high, so around 60%. And for intermediate with prostate cancer, uh, this is you know, a very high relapse rate where patients uh, can be cured. We're seeing 60% relapse rates within this small subgroup. So overall, this is all important because we know that tumors that have low levels of oxygen don't respond well to therapy. Uh, this is a now public resource for hypoxia information that's paired to mutational data, uh, and all this is available for anyone to use. And <clears throat> like I said when I started, cancer is complicated, and you know, for a long time people have been looking at it through one lens, whether that's you know, genomics or pathology or imaging. But once we start to combine this data, we can see that we can start to stratify patients into meaningful risk groups that you can then begin to potentially target. So I'll just thank uh, my supervisors, Paul and Rob, who uh, helped me for the last few years and um, many other people who contributed to this work. And I'll take any questions you have.